Audio editing and production by Jonathan Jones. Under the City Written by L. Chan Narrated by Heather Ordover Dave sits in the dark under the city. Strange that with the end so near, he cannot focus his mind. Every time he tries to concentrate, to hold a thought, it slips away, like those little silvery fish in the sea that he tried to cup in his hands as a child. He looks out into the black, empty space in front of him, trying to define the thing in the dark. Could he make out the shape of it? A deeper shade of nothing? He struggles at his bonds for a moment, but they are strong. The descent began with dark spots. Dark spots on the scan. The doctor broke the news in a practiced tone, equal parts kindness and seriousness. He pointed at each spot like they were no more than the you-are-here markings on a map. He explained that the spots were endlessly hungry and would eat until there was nothing left. The doctor tried the knife first, removing her breasts with clinical precision. Two months later, the hungry spots returned. Drugs were next, but they didn't work either. The hungry dark continued to devour her from the inside. In a matter of months, there was little left of the woman he loved. The spots grew. The doctor shook his head. Dave kept vigil by her bed until she died in her sleep without saying goodbye. Trussed up like a turkey, Dave's face is in the dirt. His irises expand, greedy to suck in any light, yet he sees nothing. He takes short, shallow breaths. He does not want his companion to wake. He fears hearing her voice again. The hungry dark was replaced with a dull ache in Dave's heart. He tried to fill the void from his wife dying with friends and then drinking. Soon after, the hospital bills came and his finances crashed. Alcohol won out over his job, sloshing in the aching bottomless pit never quite filling it. The lawyers eventually came, rendering him homeless. A drifter moving from room to rented room. When what little money he gathered was exhausted, pissed away in the stinking alleyways behind bars, he drifted from couch to couch, spending any goodwill he could scrounge from his friends and family. And one day, even that ran out. Dave discovered a new economy on the streets. Begging, stealing, conning. The alcohol stopped helping, but the streets had other delights to feed the aching dark. Other crutches. He turned to drugs and lost more of himself in the bright minutes after the poison flowed through the thin metal needles into his veins. He no longer recognized his own reflection and averted his eyes whenever his gaunt visage swam into view. Better to remember how he used to look. Smoothly muscled, passably handsome. Dave never felt the speed of his descent into thievery and madness. But when he stood over a baby's pram, with the mother's purse in one hand and the other reaching out for a bottle of milk, he knew that he had hit bottom. Still, the aching dark asked to be filled, to be fed, the last time he saw the light of the sun, he hurt a man. An easy life had left Dave unused to violence. The wallet on the park bench was too tempting an opportunity to pass. He regretted it instantly when the wallet's owner, a large middle-aged man, was hot on his trail, bellowing like a bull. The man caught him around the waist, and they tumbled to the grass together. Dave flailed wildly, desperately. Blind luck allowed him to land one heavy blow on the man's face. The fat man howled and pulled back. Dave punched, he gouged, he scratched. When his opponent was reduced to a blubbering ball of flesh, 
He lashed out with his legs, channeling months of anger and hate into every bone-shaking kick. His face was known around the park. Any one of a dozen cameras would have caught him. The sad collection of people who he shared the cardboard squat with would have given Dave's name up for nothing more than a few cigarettes. He would have to go even further off the grid and wait until the heat died down, maybe even skip town. Every breath seared his lungs. Dave paused at the mouth of a train tunnel. He thought about all the poor souls peeled from the tracks, the trains ran on a relentless schedule. Those that were unfamiliar with the rails never knew how to get out of the way in time. But they would have to do. The great bulk stirs, shifting the still air. Is it already time? The nylon twine tying his wrists is strong. The sharp edge of the rock bites into the fibers, but it is slow work. The vigorous effort leaves his wrists raw. He can't afford to break the skin. The smell of fresh blood will only wake the beast. Dave enjoyed the safety of the lonely darkness. The silence in the tunnels reassured him that he was not being pursued, and the wallet had money, which he found solace in. The only challenge was to get out alive. He began to have doubts after the third or fourth turn, but when he backtracked, he was confronted with even more choices, more turns, and more forks in the road. Weaving through the city's underbelly, Dave's thighs complained from the constant punishment. The passing hour brought a rising panic. A swollen lump at the back of his throat clutched at his tongue every time he tried to swallow. When he lost all track of time, a sinking despondency set in. Even that went away when his bones told him it had been too long since his last hit. The cramps started in the large muscles of his legs and danced up and down his thighs like fire. He grunted as the spasms chased each other. Then he fell to the ground. Shakes followed the cramps, stealing control of his body. Sweat chilled him as if icy water drenched his shirt. There, in the lonely dark, he slipped in and out of reality, pain getting the best of him. Sometimes it seemed that his wife was with him. He sensed her there, sitting in the dark, smelling of chemicals, disinfectant, and death. He felt the air brush past his cheek as she leaned in close to whisper comforting words to him. Not in the sweet musical voice she had used when they dated, but the dry rasp of her final days. Stay strong, little one, he heard her say. Help will come soon. The first strand of twine gives way. Dave presses on. When Dave came to, a small waifish girl was pressing a damp cloth to his forehead. Her face was lit by the dull, flickering glow of a single incandescent bulb. The girl startled when his eyes opened. She put a finger on Dave's lips when he tried to speak. Her features were hidden under layers of grime. She was young. The girl stood up and walked to a small table. The bulb had thrown huge, wavering shadows up on the wall. She filled a paper cup with water from a battered plastic bottle and offered it to him. He sucked it down greedily and cleared his throat after the last sweet drops had disappeared. The ache that had followed him through the tunnels seemed to evaporate. Dave sat up slowly. He was in a long chamber, still in the tunnels, lying on a nest of newspapers and cardboard. Some mismatched, dilapidated furniture decorated the space. A guttering candle added to the weak light, but the corners in the ceiling were still shrouded in darkness. Others were in the tunnel with him, dressed in ill-fitted, faded clothes. Dave had heard of this particular crowd when he was on the streets. The other dregs would whisper about the people in the tunnels, an entire ecosystem in the parts of the subway where the trains never ran. The other homeless spoke of the tunnel folk in hushed tones. They passed rumors of people that vanished below, never to return. The girl squatted in front of him, watching with her dark, inscrutable eyes. 
Her pale skin seemed almost luminous in the dim light. To Dave, she was beautiful. Thanks for saving me, he said, reaching out his hand. My name is Dave. The girl gave him a shy smile that lit up her face, the light from the bulb dancing in her eyes. She took his hand, caressed his fingers. They call me Flowers in the Night. Did your parents give you that name? A troubled look flashed across her face, gone almost before Dave caught it. My parents called me Natalie. That part of me is dead now. Excuse me? Parts of us are always taken when we're called to stay in the tunnels. The parts that hurt and tied us to the world above. Flowers nodded. He said someone needed help, so we came and found you. You're among friends now. Dave remembered the voice in the dark. I heard someone speak to me when I was lost in the tunnels. Dave slipped out from under the ratty blanket. A wave of dizziness crashed over him and he wobbled, putting out a hand for balance. He recoiled at the sight of a dark, sinuous mark on his forearm. The pattern curled around like a snake, a whirling patch of dead skin. He prodded at it gingerly, remembering his wife's cool hand in the dark, stroking his arm. He marked you. He marks us all when we are called to stay. Flowers raised her thin, pale forearm, pulling up her sweater sleeve. The same mark curled, undulating across her skin in the flickering light. Who are you talking about? Dave asked, his voice rising. Who spoke to me in the dark? He had dismissed his wife's voice as a fever dream or hallucination. Flowers looked at him, her dark eyes wide with mirth. You aren't ready to know yet. When the time is right. She turned and swept away into the shadows. Dave struggles. He strains his ears, suddenly alert. Each stroke of the twine against the rock produces a low rasp. His heartbeats pound in his ears. The thing in the darkness, is it aware of him yet? He gets back to work, slowly, methodically. He does not want to die there. It's easy to get used to the warm, welcoming half-darkness under the city. There was no pain or yearning. Dave's need for the drugs was miraculously gone. Flowers smiled when he mentioned it. She showed Dave the needle marks, not on her arms, but between her toes. Suddenly, he understood that the ache was gone and it would never come back. It had been a long time since he had space for thoughts beyond his next meal or fix. He felt like he had a purpose, to help and be helped. Even after a week, Dave still had trouble remembering names and faces. The flickering light turned people into shadows and back again. He spent most of the first few days asleep, waking to find a plate of cold food. Sometimes flowers would be in the corner of the alcove watching him, stroking the strange scar on her arm. The food was simple and scavenged from the city above. Ends of loaves of bread, tins of food, half-eaten meat. Dave's strength returned after some time, though time held no meaning under the city. He slept when he was tired. He woke when he felt rested. He learned to work again, his hands and feet unsteady. He helped by fetching water and laying out the scavenged food in the communal larder. Flowers became his closest friend. Eventually, Dave asked her to show him the way back to the surface. She brushed his forearm with her cool fingertips, and he felt a tingle. The wavering light made it seem like the scar was twisting around his forearms, straining towards Flower's touch. She laughed, the sound high and joyous like the tinkle of a glass bell. Dear heart, if you have to ask, you're not ready. ready, ready. Dave had looked into the Stygian beyond and thought twice about venturing out on his own. The flashlights and torches were guarded. Even with a light, he would get lost in the tunnels. So he saved the thought for a different day. Dave feels his bonds breaking, progressing slowly but steadily, the twine separates one fiber at a time. 
He forces his hands down, keeping the pressure. Then he feels the scrape of the rock's edge on his wrist and the sharp, coppery tang of blood fills the air. Nothing topside for folks like me, Brad said. He was a bear of a man, over six feet tall and thickly muscled. His group went above ground to scavenge and trade. He'd been living in the tunnels for close to five years. He was one of the first few to go down. How many miles of tunnel do you think we got in the city? Dave asked. Brad gave a snort and thumped Dave on the back so hard he nearly bit the tip of his tongue off when his teeth clicked shut. Truth is, nobody knows, Brad said. Back when I was topside, I started out with some of the crews digging out the tunnels for the trains. We'd have these massive digging machines that just about chewed up the rock and shit it out in chunks. Rest of us would be loading it up and carting it off to the surface. At least that was the plan. There are hundreds of miles under the city. We don't use it all. We didn't even dig it all. Something else did, long before we got there. Brad grew animated as he spoke, absentmindedly scratching at the twisting scar on his arm. Dave felt his scar itching at the sight. He sat on his free hand to stop it from creeping up to rub at his own scar. I remember when we busted through the thin wall. Looked like a chamber. Wasn't big and hollow like a cave, kind of like how we dug it, longish for travel. Except it wasn't one of our tunnels. Walls were smooth and old. We sent two guys in first. When they hollered, the rest of the crew followed. I stayed to watch the equipment. Nobody wants the lights to go out when you're underground. Two of them came out, said there was something I needed to see. They had this crazy thousand-yard look in their eyes. Next thing I know, they grabbed me and hauled me into the tunnel. That's when I heard it. You heard a voice? Dave asked. No two people hear the same one. For me, it was my dad. My wife, Dave nodded. Cancer. Brad's eyes opened wider at the news. My dad, too. The man was still a pack a day when he was trying to quit. It got his lungs and his throat in the end. They had to cut a hole in him just so that he could breathe. That's what I remember his voice sounding like. That funny mechanical sound that was left. That's what was speaking to me in the dark. None of us ever talked about what we heard that day. But you came back down. Yeah, years later. I quit. Fell off the grid like you. I hadn't kept in touch with others from that day. I think some of them killed themselves. I came close a few times. Once or twice, when I got really close, when I was just a pill away from never waking up, I thought I was back under the city with the things speaking in my father's voice. It called. It called me back. So I came. What is it? What's in the dark? Brad leaned back, his eyes taking on a glaze of reminiscence. I don't know what it is, but it's big. And old. Older than the city. Maybe older than people. And it's hungry. Brad caught himself, snapping back to attention. He unfolded his arms, got to his feet and walked away. Dave's hands are slippery with blood, warm and sticky. He feels the beast stir. Shouts pierce the darkness in the tunnels, bouncing off the walls, coming from everywhere at once. All the people in the tunnel stood as Brad came hurtling into the light, clutching his shoulder. Blood stained his fingers. Two others from Brad's group followed, dragging a struggling young man behind them. Punks jumped us, Brad hissed through gritted teeth. Don't know what the hell they thought they could steal. This one got me with a knife. The other took off. Careful with him. That dog bites. Flowers stood up straight. The tunnels will take care of the other. We know what must be done with this one. She drifted by Dave, her eyes dark and fathomless. You will help. The young man struggled while Dave pulled him deeper into the tunnels. Dave had never been down that far. The light from the settlement faded into the distance. The darkness swallowed them. Each footstep 
was an act of faith, and the quiet shuffle of feet on the dusty floor behind him reminded Dave that he wasn't alone. The dimly lit hovels were a world away. The only things that existed were his hands gripped tight around the sweat-slicked forearm of the interloper, and his quiet, wheezing breaths. The young man had threatened at first. His demeanor softened as the light dimmed in the tunnels. The threats melted into pleadings, and the pleadings into quiet moans and sobs. All of it wasted on his impassive audience. The texture of the air changed, and the echo of the footsteps were not as pronounced. Dave sensed they were no longer in a tunnel, but inside a larger chamber. Flower's slim fingers tapped his shoulder, and the procession stopped. Flowers leaned in close. You must not be afraid, she whispered. You are safe as long as you are one of us. Her fingers danced down Dave's arm, lingered slightly at his strange scars. Warm breath tickled his ear. It's awake. Dave grew aware of a stirring in the air, an uncoiling of something in the darkness, the rasp of something sliding across the dry floor. The trespasser fought to free himself, mewling in terror. He twisted wildly, seemingly powered by a primal fear. Dave felt the dull body heat of a vast thing in front of them. When the creature exhaled, Dave was enveloped in the fetid old carrion on its breath. The itch on his arm became unbearable. The trespasser quivered and was suddenly pulled forward. Dave dug his heels into the ground to keep his own balance. Then all three of them were thrown back. Dave landed hard on his side, his hands still locked in a vice-like grip around the man's forearm. The trespasser's hand twitched spastically, his fingers clenching and unclenching. Dave propped himself up on his elbow, unwilling to loosen his hold. When the struggling stopped, Dave adjusted his fingers for a better grip. He felt the ragged edge of flesh and bone and screamed as he threw the severed arm away. Flowers leaned in to tell Dave that they were done. Unable to move, afraid of what lurked in the darkness, he had to be hauled to his feet and nudged forward. Free. Dave's hands are free. He flexes his fingers quickly. The flow of blood back to his fingertips prickles. He starts working on the knots on his legs. Halfway back, his foot hit something small and hard, the clink suggesting that it was not just another rock. Bending down, he felt the straight plastic edges of a mobile phone. He realized the young man must have dropped it as they drug him to his death. The man's blood was still on Dave's face and arms. The spray in those few moments of chaos served as a reminder of the beast. He shivered at the thought of its hideous hot breath, fading away in the chill of that empty space. He wanted to run then and there, but he had no chance of evading so many. And there was still the thing itself to deal with. Dave knew what he needed to do. Once back, he patiently waited until most of the group had left their part of the tunnels. Thankfully, Flowers had taken several others into the depths to clean up whatever was left of the interloper. Dave spent an hour pretending to organize the larder. He filled his pockets with food and packed a bag with water bottles. He planned to run until the cell phone received a signal and then call the police. Whatever the people under the city were doing, he wanted no part in it. He ran. The pain began as he left the dim lights behind. The scar on Dave's forearm squirmed, burning as though it was being flayed from his skin. He bit down hard on the inside of his cheek to keep from screaming. He forged on. Each step ratcheted up the level of agony. It felt like something had soaked his hand in gasoline and set it alight. Dave, unable to take another step, sagged to his knees, defeated. Why do you flee? His wife's dead voice echoed from the dark, a mocking, taunting tone. Why do you run? 
There is nothing left for you above. You were running when I found you. Half dead. Broken, spoiled. Look at you now. Running again, but to what? Everything you need is here. The pain was replaced with a throbbing buzz like the purr of a content cat. The thud of footsteps approached. Dave held up the mobile phone, its tiny, bright screen a futile protest against the darkness. Flowers appeared out of the shadows, a lopsided smile on her face. Wasn't what I gave you enough? The dead voice came from her dry lips. Dave wanted to scramble backwards, but his scarred arm would not obey. Flowers was clad in a form-fitting black outfit, dark and skin-tight. Except she wasn't. Dave saw the light of the phone bouncing off the fine hairs on her arm. Flowers was naked. Her entire body was covered by the strange black scars. Strong hands seized Dave from behind, too strong to fight off. Yes, Dad, we'll bring him to you, Brad mumbled, as if replying to someone only he could hear. As they led him back into the chamber, Dave wondered why the thing always took on the voices of the dead. He wondered if anybody had ever heard its true voice. Then he saw the gaze of madness in Flower's eyes and had his answer. Almost free. Almost, but not quite. Dave feels a thousand eyes on him, the eyes of this ancient entity, this terrible old one, hungry, but never dying, aching, but never filled, just like the darkness within. Its presence rolls over his skin, and the scar on his arm purrs in pleasure. His savior whispers secrets to him in its true voice, and he finally understands. Dave smiles in the darkness under the city. <laughs> 